Hey everyone, and we're back for the Season 7, Episode 3, Serious Q&A. Why is John trying to keep his resurrection a secret? This is the $64,000 question. Letting people know that he's the chosen one resurrected from the dead may help his recruiting campaign. Then again, maybe John is thinking about something else. The simplest answer to why John is keeping his death and resurrection a secret is that he's going around telling a story about the White Walkers that already sounds crazy, and he doesn't want to add any more craziness to the tale. That said, there may be more to it which relates to what is John now exactly. George R. R. Martin recently referred to Beric Dondarrion as a Fire White. If Beric is a Fire White, then John is probably a Fire White too. I guess this means John is dead or undead? So John is ironically trying to get people to fight an army of the dead when he himself is dead? And I suppose all of that wouldn't be the best PR when recruiting. Now we don't know what a Fire White is, or what an Ice White is, or if there are other Whites, what is Cold Hands exactly. And with regard to all of them, we aren't sure if they're puppets, or if they have individuality, or perhaps they have a mixture. We don't know if they have individual minds, or if they have decentralized equal hive minds, or if they have hive minds that are anchored in leaders like White Walkers. We don't know if they're animated through telepathy or telekinesis or some unexplainable magic. But I suppose John is a simple man and doesn't want to get into these complicated questions that may not have answers. Why did they decrease the amount of episodes this season claiming that there is enough story material while it is clear they are rushing things and skipping important events, conversations during the last two seasons? Well, I too think there is plenty of story to tell and claiming that they're out of story material is a load of shit. Some say that D&D have been moving on to other things and are a little checked out. That might be the case, but I think it mainly has to do with budget. Many of the actors are paid by the episode, so when they all got pay raises, there was less money to work with. The solution was to have fewer episodes. For seasons 5 and 6, Lena Headey, Nikolai Kosterwaldo, Kit Harrington, Amelia Clark, and Peter Dinklage each got $300,000 an episode. For seasons 7 and 8, they're getting $1.1 million an episode. So by cutting the episode count by seven, you're saving almost $40 million just on those five actors. Meanwhile, people will still be paying the same amount for their HBO subscriptions. So what's up with that random serving woman who saw Jamie and Cersei? Why give a speaking role to an extra? I'm calling it now. She will play a major role, either by being captured or forced to reveal the incest, or it'll be Arya's next face. So Vanity Fair did an entire article on this random woman. Apparently, in one of the oddest and most pointless bits of continuity, this woman, who is apparently named Bernadette, has been with us since season two. In the second season, she's the servant who found Sansa trying to cover up her first menstruation. In the third season, she's there when Tyrion tells Sansa that they're to be married. In the fourth season, she tells Cersei about Shay, and in the sixth season, she tells Cersei that Jaime and Marcella have returned to Dorne. And it may seem odd that Bernadette has taken on this new haircut and new outfit, but it seems that all of Cersei's handmaidens, who can be seen at the back wall there, have taken on this outfit, and at least one other has taken on a short haircut. The handmaidens can be seen in this scene as well. What do you think about the easy defeat of the Tyrells? Is it me or was Alina one of the smartest characters? She had not done a lot of stupid shit like others. Can you think of something really stupid she did in the show? Oof, the fall of Highgarden. You know, I think there are many possible ways to make the Lannisters win over the Tyrells that would have made total sense. The show chose none of them. First and foremost, the Tyrells were established as having a dominant army. It's an army that could hand Renly his kingship. It's an army that was needed for the Lannisters to defeat Stannis. It's an army that the Lannisters feared enough to keep them in a fairly equal alliance with the Tyrells for four seasons. Second, the Tyrells are in a superior fortified position. And third, they have bannermen. So for Alina to say that fighting wasn't the Tyrells thing, it's ridiculous. Now, there were plenty of other options to make the Lannisters win logically. The show could have simply sewn a bunch of Westerland, Riverland, Stormland, and yes, even Reach banners, and made it look like Jaime had an overwhelming force. It would have made a lot of sense since they already established that Cersei was rallying lords. Or they simply could have said that the Tarleys were the tipping point and the Reachers all abandoned the Tyrells. Oddly, the show didn't show any other banners, not even the Tarleys. It showed only a bunch of Lannister banners and guys in Lannister armor. 
Alternatively, they could have just said that Randall was a great general and outmaneuvered the Tyrells. After all, they already established that Randall was the best, which is why Jaime convinced him to come over. They could have just said Randall is a genius and he knew every castle's defenses and every general's tactics in all the Seven Kingdoms. Thus, the Lannisters won. But instead, they just did this fighting is not our thing because of a rose sigil. It was pretty dumb and pretty lazy. Now there is the question of whether Olena is actually smart or if she also does stupid things. Well, her signature clever plan, the murder of Joffrey, is actually pretty stupid. It was unnecessarily risky and convoluted. Why team up with Littlefinger to begin with? And why give the poison to Dantos, an irresponsible money-focused drunk, to give to a little girl to then carry in? And this is all done so Alina herself could do the murder? I mean, that's pretty roundabout and ridiculous. I mean, imagine if you wanted to kill a head of state. Would you give your gun to a crack addict to then give to a Girl Scout to then hand back to you so you can do the hit? Anyway, besides Joffrey's murder, her handling of the High Sparrow was also pretty stupid. The Lannisters and Tyrells both wanted to get rid of the guy. They could have just stormed the Sept with their army at any time. In the middle of battle, would the Sparrows really go to Loras and Marjorie's cells and kill them? It doesn't really seem that likely. Why didn't Sam ask Jorah to vouch for Jon when he returned to Danny? He basically sent Jon to Dragonstone. Sam wasted a huge opportunity to advance Jon's agenda by letting Jorah walk away without telling him what he knows. Jorah owes Sam his life. The least he could have done was pass on the message about how much Jon needs Dragonglass and about the White Walker threat. You're absolutely right, and there was so much wasted potential here. There were so many topics they could have talked about. John being Gior's squire, John saving Gior from a white, John getting Longclaw as a reward, the White Walkers, Lyanna Mormont's support for John, the Dragonglass on Dragonstone. I mean, had I written the scene, I would have had Ebros' inspection find Jorah covered with big bloody wounds. Then he would have been very angry at Sam, but curious about the results of surgery for research purposes. I would have had Ebros quarantine Sam with Jorah partly as punishment, and partly because Sam may have contracted Grayscale. And then when quarantined together, I would have perhaps one night Sam reveal to Jorah why he came south. He would talk about the army of the dead and how there's dragonglass on dragonstone that can fight them. He can talk about the great ranging and the attack on the fist of the first men and how Gior died at Craster's Keep. And then Jorah could vow to do everything he could to help them if he survives. But alas, none of that happened. Please, can we address how laughably bad Bran was? He behaves like a perfectly normal guy while he's in the cave and at the heart tree at the end of last season, but now when he arrives at Winterfell, he's suddenly behaving like a badly written Jojen Reed. Yeah, Bran definitely caught a lot of people off guard. Not that it isn't somewhat understandable that he'd turn out this way, but his transformation happened off screen. Bran was acting normal in the last episode of the season and then connected into the Weirwood net. He was then at the Tower of Joy and seemed pretty normal there too, and then he shows up at the wall and he's fried. It was disconnected, which is why it didn't work. All we really needed was just one more scene at the tree, with some more memory flashes and Mira looking worried and yelling, Bran, come back! But sadly, they didn't give us that. I don't quite know where they're going to go with the Bran character. Bran is selectively omniscient, so the showrunners are going to have him know some information, like Sansa's rape but we'll probably not have him know other information, like about Littlefinger's role in stopping Ned's coup. He'll probably know what the plot needs him to know, which is going to be odd and frustrating. The meeting between Jon and Danny was so incredibly frustrating. Where was Varys, who could have vouched for Ned Stark and confirmed that he fought King Robert about sending assassins after her both times? And they seem to have completely forgotten that Melisandre specifically told them to have Jon tell them what he has seen. And she could have also backed him up so they could take him seriously. Yeah, this is a pretty common trope that some call the third act misunderstanding or the plot mandated friendship failure. The story requires that certain facts are withheld in order to facilitate misunderstanding. Or as the Order of the Stick puts it, I'm torn because on the one hand I want to share something important that happened to me while we were apart, but on the other hand, bardic tradition demands that I withhold it all so that at some later point you can accidentally learn an incomplete version and jump to all the wrong conclusions, thus leading to entertaining dramatic conflict later in our relationship. Hey Preston, why did Bran say he can see everything? I thought the Three-Eyed Crow could only look where werewood trees are located. Isn't that what Osha said about the old gods? 
How can they see if they haven't any eyes or something to that effect? Thanks, dude. I think this has to do with the strength and abilities of the telepath. Certainly in the books, we find out that people have degrees of telepathic ability. In Veramir Sixskins, the second greatest telepath in the world, describes certain animals being harder than other animals to control. And of course, controlling more than one animal is more difficult than controlling just one. That said, Veramir is a great telepath, but he's not strong enough to take over a human. Bran, though, is strong enough to control humans, at least Hodor, and very nearly Mira. But skin changing goes even beyond animals or even life. The children of the forest say their souls go into the trees and into the stone. And Vermeer Sixskins, at least briefly, describes existing in other non-living items. When he leaves his body for the final time, he's first in a werewood, and then he's simply in the open air, on the wind, in the clouds, then in animals and in an oak. So yes, the werewood may be one of the easiest things to skin change, but one can skin change other things, even open air, at least temporarily. Now, that said, being everywhere currently is different from being everywhere in the past. At least in the books, we haven't seen anyone with this ability. The Werewoods allowed Bran and Bloodraven to time travel a bit and see past events, and they can exist in a lot of different places in the present. But the combination, that is, different places in the past, has not been seen. Showbrand seems to be able to skin change open air and time travel with open air as well. Thus his ability to skin change Hodor in the past, spy on Sansa getting raped, be at the Tower of Joy, you name it. And that's all for now for this Q&A. We'll see you guys next time. Thanks for watching.